So welcome to the next episode of the iPhotography podcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Today we're talking about what camera settings we use and who are we? We are four of the iPhotography tutors. Did that so- freeze for anybody else then? Sorry. No. What was that? No. You all just went away and my face was like, what's going on? Oh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry, carry on, Stephen. I don't you're know. Have... No, it's Can fine. we keep so that gonna... bit in? I'm... That's staying yeah. in. Definitely right <laughs> I literally now. thought as soon as you <laughs> press <laughs> record that you'd left me and I was just in here on my own. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. I think this is the best start to one of our podcasts ever. <laughs> We're going to have to actually watch the video version of this to understand my what they really changed. <laughs> I'm very sorry. But let's actually kind of put names to these voices that everybody can hear if you've not joined us before. Because it's not just myself. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the iPhotography tutors. But I've got three other tutors with me today. I've got Emily, as you been hearing who's having a panic over her internet connection hello everybody (laughs) it's gone from seductive to operatic if you've not heard previous episodes and we've got rachel hello (laughs) and we've got nick hi there this is starting off so professional honestly because my topic today was about what camera settings we can use as professionals (laughs) obviously not professional presenters (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> good, so, good job really isn't it <laughs> well because everyone's i suppose within uh, the whole scheme of, uh, of photography obviously there's different disciplines different genres and within that everybody has a different approach in the same way that like an, an artist would or a dancer would as well there's all different requirements so i thought it was a good opportunity that the four of us can maybe talk a bit about uh maybe what we use as kit um how we think or how we approach any kind of photo shoots whether it's just a personal project or a paid project and kind of what settings that we use maybe if there's a specific kind of set of arrangement of settings that you can use uh, over and over again and maybe why you do that for your type of work so I figured that we almost would basically work through this as a you know an individual case study per person um, so I'm literally just going to jump to my uh, my left on my screen here and I'm going to go to Emily first. Um, for those of you who have not met Emily before, uh, Emily is a professional wedding portrait videographer. Um, you run your own business um, as a wedding photographer, so I'm sure you've got kind of lots of insights, obviously on the business side, but we'll kind of concentrate more specifically just on the camera side to begin with. So do you want to give us a little bit of a, of a background and a little bit of an idea as to how you approach the world of photography? Uh, So I am primarily a Lumix shooter. Um, I I tend to have more lenses than Jessup's, to be honest. I'm a little bit of a (laughs) a camera nerd. Um, I like to think that that's all justified, but really I just um, I just I just want all of the camera equipment. I have I have issues Um, when it comes to wedding photography. I am very much of the mindset that the camera can do if the camera can do as much work as possible I can think about more important things like composition and getting the right uh, sort of results for the couple so I'm very much not a a, a purist Uh, I'll use manual mode when I need to like for off-camera flash work but primarily if the camera can do something for me I'm letting the camera do it so (laughs) throughout the day I will um sort of switch between shutter speed priority and aperture priority depending on the situation at hand and the lighting that I have. Um, Another thing with with, with weddings in particular is utilizing burst mode. If you, uh, you know, most people think about burst mode for for, for wildlife or sports, uh, but it's actually so, so, so important for portraiture. Uh, particularly if you're taking candid uh, images, because that split second between the frames can make a complete difference. So I'm all for uh, burst mode and continual autofocus and letting the camera do all the work for me, then I can think about other things on the day. Yeah, I, I think it's so you're so right that, yeah, the less you have to worry about, I suppose, in your head, then you can just kind of focus upon, you know, what's in front of you, really. I mean, with I suppose obviously it always differs, you know, you can't ever say if there's only one set of camera settings I use, you know, over and over again, because light is never changing thing. But is there certain things that you like to go to? Is there a way that you have your camera set up, whether it is, as you say, like obviously with, with burst mode, but is there any other settings either that you would recommend or something you just find that, you, you know, you're quite comfortable with, whether it be uh, exposure modes or uh, focus modes, etc., or anything like that? One thing that I do for weddings is I keep my exposure compensation a little bit hot. I make up like a third of a stop because I know uh, with the way that I edit, it's quite light and airy and quite bright uh, just because uh, traditionally weddings are quite 
dull in England, so we have to fake it till we make it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I generally shoot a little bit hot all day, and I don't know if that's uh, just something I've picked up over time, or if, if if that's something other wedding photographers do. But it does it gets me closer to I see how I'm going to edit it. So if I slightly overexpose everything throughout the day, it helps me in editing. That's 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 a really good thing, I suppose. Did you do that um, kind of from quite early on, or is that something you've learned to do? It's something I've learned to do in the last few years because I noticed every single image I would start editing in Lightroom, the first thing I'd do is bump the exposure. Uh, and I'm like, oh, if I can do that in camera, that saves me like ten seconds an image. That's great. Exactly. Yeah. You, you obviously know your style. You know, you you've established that style to be able to then shoot for it. And as you say. If it, even if it's you know milliseconds it saves you, you can add all those milliseconds up and waste it somehow else <laughs> definitely uh, for my custom mode you know where you can save your, your presets on your camera because yeah. I do shoot a uh, hybrid I do sort of videography and photography a lot of my custom modes are taken up with the video modes so it really is me just quickly doing the photography settings each time I need to use it uh, so maybe I need to look for a camera with more custom settings. That'll be a good excuse to buy another camera. Another camera, yeah, <laughs> because you've got 10 fingers, so surely okay. you should be able to have one, you know, pointing on each of the shutters. Definitely. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, I'm going to kind of come uh, we'll move around for a minute. I'm going to come to Rachel uh, again. If nobody's um, if you've not listened to this uh, podcast previously as well, Rachel is our resident wildlife photographer. I know you do a lot of uh, you've done a lot of portrait photography as well, um, similar to Emily, but focusing specifically more upon your wildlife. Is there any I suppose? Yeah. Do you have like a routine in respect to kind of how you approach your work with uh, you know the certain camera kit that you use knowing what you're going to be photographing do you have like a I suppose I'm re reducing this to the simplest uh, kind of thinking as well but you have a, a a lens for your birds a lens for your pets you know a lens for bigger animals etc do you kind of split your kit up in that way yes um I do actually I've got a camera with a lens on that goes up to 105 I think it's 1805 that I use for pets um I like to be a bit more on the ground in the mud with the dogs so I can normally get a lot closer to them than I can with obviously I don't want to actually get in the ground with a wild <laughs> animal <laughs> um so I would use a longer lens for that so I've got a lens that goes up to um 600 mil um, which I use mainly for my my birds and animals I can't get close to. Um, I, I do use different settings. So for dogs, I'm generally doing that for a client. Um, so I'm trying to think of what they want, which is generally they want their dog looking happy and cute. And um, so I do kind of approach that completely differently I'm trying to capture the animal in a way that obviously I can sell an image to them um so that's a lot more you could say posed I, I try and get the animal to do what I want it to do basically <laughs> whereas in the wild it's completely opposite I'm at the mercy of the animal um you mean so... elephants don't respond to dog biscuits or anything like that <laughs> 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 they probably would quite like them actually yeah um <laughs> yeah so yeah you do approach it quite differently so with um the animals in the wild I generally use more higher shutter speeds um particularly obviously if they're moving maybe if they're quite still like if you if you were doing a lion that was mm. just chilling out then I might use more aperture work and try and work my way through a few apertures to see what depth of field I, I'm happy with yeah um so do, you, do you approach sorry i was gonna say do you no, approach go. anything similar to maybe like what emily does with her exposure compensation knowing do you kind of think about exactly how you want it to look at the very end and shoot for that or do you just kind of take your opportunities as they arise or try things out in the field um i, I am very much a try it out in the field person but i have learned over time the same as emily to it, overexpose a little bit um I don't know if this is a term just for wildlife but we call it exposing to the right so when you histogram it just peaks a bit more on the right because noise hides in your shadows and that's a real issue when you're shooting a 
or something like a beautiful animal you don't really want any noise in it as much yeah. well as much as possible so just overexposing helps that a bit um so yeah i'll either do that i'm a bit of a control freak actually i do shoot on manual um i have nothing against shooting on aperture or shutter priority it's just i think because i learned on um like nick i i started off on um just an analog camera and that was all we had and i just feel that that's how I am (laughs) so um but Emily is totally right though I mean the cameras now can do amazing things and you should really let them do most of the work that's what you're paying Mm. for um so yeah but I do like to shoot on manual and then um, just control my shutter aperture and ISO myself and then I use the other functions to help me out along the way yeah I'm I'm with you I I've well when I first went into my kind of my jobs etc then yeah I was well, you were literally given the camera and it was it was like a high-end Canon and there was no um opportunity to change to aperture prior it was just manual it was set yeah. on that so you you're forced to learn that way but I think it's you know you're informed enough to be able to make the changes but there was certain things I never changed things like focus um you know focus modes or uh exposure modes etc as well i let the camera effectively kind of take charge of those but just by controlling obviously the, the levels and the rates etc and you know you start to understand your camera itself so yeah I, I completely understand where you're coming from from that side and yeah and with, with nick as well again maybe introducing nick as our uh, say a resident kind of fine art traditional photography you've kind of covered kind of quite a few different areas within photography i would say nick but you also kind of have experience that probably goes outside of our period of, of like digital photography that we've talked about well yeah <laughs> trying to put this nicely that you maybe you maybe have a few more years on ourselves but i think just that's an few. insight, <laughs> an insight <laughs> and, a, and a level of knowledge that you will uh, you'll be able to kind of cast you know across that that we wouldn't either but do you do you have approaches in your your photography do you have specific things that you always look to do or certain types of cameras that you like etc uh, it's well it's probably very much grounded in the fact that I you know started taking photographs I mean I hate to say this I, I got a camera when I was like five years up years old and it was just a point and shoot Kodak Instamatic and that was in the 60s so you know quite a long time ago um so I've the way I've developed has always been through analog, I guess. So I, I started off with point and shoot cameras and then learned to use an SLR and it was always a manual SLR. I'd, I'd have like a, a, a fancy sort of, even the later, later on, I tended not to have the aperture priority or sh- shutter priority types. They were just fully manual. Uh, and then when I went into working commercially, I shot on medium format a lot of the time. And again, the medium format cameras were just manual cameras that we use. So as all, so that I still do. I mean, I've got a, I've got a Canon DSLR now, uh, but most of the settings on it, I, I mean, I, you know, I've gone through it all and I think, do I need it now? I don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. So I don't use them. So there's all these settings on it that I don't use. I tend to always shoot ma- either manually if I'm working, say, in, in like doing a, like, say, portrait still life, sort of working indoors, I like to have that full control. Um, if I'm out and about, I, I quite like the fact that you can just set it and you use it as a point and shoot camera. So that's one of the things that I like about digital cameras. You can use them just uh, like a point and shoot camera at the same time, which is pretty much why I quite like using my phone as well when I'm out and about. I've, I've got nothing against the quality of cameras on phones is so good these days that, you know, I, I, I think that they're as valid as using a camera. It all depends on what you're doing it for, obviously. Um, so, yeah. The, the other thing is for me, because a lot of the work that I did with studio work, I guess I, I kind of kept camera equipment. We always kept very simple um it was always much more concerned with light than camera so your camera setup would be really simple um but then you'd have a lot of lights to play around with so a lot of the studio work was to do with lighting different lighting setups and even going out on location um you'd take you know to do interiors for architecture and stuff like that it would be getting the lighting right so i was always a lot more focused on lighting i think than actual camera settings and things like that it's quite interesting when you said that initially nick <clears throat> pardon me, 
all three of us were started nodding. You know, I, I think that's kind of, I say the sign, a sign of a not a real photographer because that's that's kind of quite a, a rude word to say, but somebody who really knows the basics is that how important light is over the actual tool that you're using. As you say, if you have the right light, yeah. you could shoot with a you know a half decent iPhone as well as a, a high end DSLR, you know, and still produce kind of quality images. But and I think it's it's important to remember that as much as we're talking about kits and settings etc about how your environment and your other accessories be it light you know how important they are to contribute to a good picture because yeah you could have a you know three thousand four thousand pound camera um but you, you could capture images that are just as good as you know something on a smartphone if you don't know what you're doing with it but if the light's in your right favor then yeah you can capture images great either side of it really as well so, i mean I think for me, obviously, also having a very strong interest in the history of photography and having studied and taught history of art and design and stuff like that. So for me, a lot of the, the stuff that I look at and the, 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 the photography that I really like, I'm very much aware of the fact that it was done using very simple equipment uh, and that, a lot, you know, somebody like Cartier Bresson would just go out with a Leica camera uh it was just you know it wasn't a, even an slr was it it was just like a, a simple point and shoot camera and got some of the most amazing images so you kind of think there's so much more to it than equipment and camera settings obviously it's important to know how to use them but it's it you know in the end it, it, it's there's you know it, it, it's a visual thing isn't it and it's however you're getting that that image that you want it's how you get it and I quite like being being restricted I quite like the idea of going out with a pinhole camera and or, or doing so you know limiting yourself to something really really simple like like your phone just on one setting and thinking what can I do with that what can I you know how can I create a you know an interesting image with whatever equipment I've got and that's yeah. I think what motivates me more than anything else it, it comes down to the the content you know what what the image is about over its quality for you is is that kind of more where you lean about the yeah. story in that sense yeah yeah I, I i think there is and i think there is um i don't know whether that's a a thing just because of backgrounds etc you know what you grow up seeing etc and how you've experienced photography when you grow up to say you know how somebody who grew up in the 21st century because i think it'd be amazing to see how people now who are maybe what, 20 21 years old what their experience of photography is you know they chances are they've never picked up a film camera you know they they may just see it as such an arduous process to go and get it developed etc and it takes a few weeks and you've not got a picture there and then it's it's incredible to think of what photography could be in another even 10 years not, yeah, even, not yeah, even that long as well it could be something you know so left field that we're not even thinking of right now it's very very interesting to see how you know if we revisited this podcast in a couple of years how much you know the sand has shifted and, and what it looks like really but um it has changed a lot and i, I mean there's certain things that i miss i think i i, I always loved uh, Polaroid because I, I just like the instant quality of it. The fact that you just have that one, one shot and that was it. So yeah. you one shot and you peel it apart and, and that's it. And uh, there's something really special about that. And, and I think that's something, certain things like that, that we kind of miss out on because you've, you've got almost like too much. There's too much there now. And I quite liked the limits that we had in the past. A group question then, as opposed to wrap up, would anybody give up all their digital equipment for a week, a month, a year and go back and shoot on film? I like I shooting would. on film. And, and <laughs> I have like Polaroids for days in my little uh, thing. I mean, yeah, you know, the little Insta, Instamax ones. Oh, they're, they they're, out. Yeah, they're, they're great, so nice. aren't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a little film camera collection. Uh, but I, I didn't really start on on film. I, I just got the very, very first uh, digital cameras where, you know, it was about half a megapixel and you thought it was amazing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do. I enjoy taking like I've got the Pentax K1000 and, and a couple of the Olympus ones. It's lovely going out because, as Nick said, you only have a finite amount of images. So you really have to think about each and every one. And you've always got that, this is gonna cost money to develop. <laughs> so you don't just wanna take photos of any old thing. Um, and it's a really refreshing ap approach sometimes, I think. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I think it's it's got its whole, uh, I think it's a whole discussion on its own really, the, 
the benefits and the lessons that could be learned from film photography as to how you then translate it into digital photography to become a better photographer in all. But uh, I think this has been a fantastic uh, kind of discussion initially as well. I think, it, you know, we could potentially kind of go back and revisit each of your own kind of uh, experiences individually in different podcasts. And sometimes, you know, hopefully we will do that in the future as well. Um, and obviously, if, you know, if you're listening to this and you've got different experiences yourselves, if you've been a photographer for quite a while, then get in touch. We'd love to kind of know different people's experience as well, because this can all help new people that are coming into this industry and this hobby so check out other iPhotography podcasts there there's lots more available and there's lots more coming up and obviously if you want to get in touch you can find us on Facebook Instagram Twitter and YouTube we're pretty much about most days and obviously if you're wanting to know a little bit more about iPhotography if you've never heard of us to begin with you can check us out at iPhotography.com we've got a huge array of different training courses and a membership platform where you can get some really great personal photo critiques uh, from myself and the rest of the tutors that you see here so thank you so much for listening in the meantime um, hopefully you've enjoyed it and it's been uh, insightful and entertaining as always and catch us on another episode I just want to say thank you very much to Emily, Rachel and Nick for joining us this evening. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening and hopefully we'll catch you again soon. So bye from now and bye from everybody else. Sorry for crashing the intro. <laughs> you just crashed the outro as well, so well yes. done. Yeah, yeah. I've got to bookend it, haven't you? Yeah. Well done. Bye now. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye.